31, let's take a look at example two. In example two, we're going to find the inverse of this function f of x. And if we take a look at that function, I just want us to take note that there's a radical in here. So we are gonna have to address a potential domain issue. Now, we've done this type of example before. We did this in section 3.7. Um, and example two of that section. That's why section 5.7 is like a little review of section 3.7, but we just go a bit beyond that in terms of the difficulties of the problems. So we've talked about the three domain issues that we can have in math, right? The, so in terms of domain issues, right, we have fractions where the denominator is zero, right? Radicals, where we have an even index and a negative radicand and logarithms. And so we would need to, hopefully our spidey senses would go off a bit and you say, oh, I do have a radical here. But the upside is you have a cube root. You don't have a square root or a fourth root, it's a cube root. So you're fine. We're allowed to take cube roots of positive and negative numbers and zero for that matter. So we're fine here. The domain of this function would stay as all real numbers. There's nothing I need to give the boot to from this domain. Now, if I'm being asked to find the inverse of a function, we do wanna make sure this is a one-to-one -one function. So let me get my calculator up. Let me clear out what I have in there. And let's go ahead and put the cube root of this function in. Now, cube roots, they do exist on your calculator. Texas Instruments program them in, and they're in your math key. So before I click anything else, let's hit our math button. And if you look down here at option four, it says cube root. If you had anything beyond option, I'm sorry, beyond a cube root, like a fourth root or a fifth root, you could use option five. That's what the X root stands for. But Texas Instruments knows that cube roots are pretty common. That's why they have a, its own dedicated menu item for it. And they know square roots are very common. That's why there's actually a button for it. All right, so I'm gonna go down to option four. Let's type in x plus four, and then let's go ahead and hit zoom six, and take a look that, that does look like a function. It's passing the vertical line test. It also looks like a one-to-one -one function because it's passing the horizontal line test. So okay, I know that this, I know not only is its domain all real numbers, it is a one-to-one -one function. And that just tells us that the inverse function exists. F inverse of x, this thing that I'm being tasked with finding, it exists. So let's go find it. So we talked about how you find inverse function, or the equation of an inverse function in section 3.7. The first thing you wanna do is interchange an x, x and y. So wherever I see an x, I'm gonna write a y. And wherever I see a y, I'm gonna write an x. And you might be saying, well, I don't see any y's just yet. Well, we have function notation and y and x, excuse me, y and f of x are the same thing. So if this is my original function, the first thing I wanna do is interchange x and y. So you'll see that where I saw a y, I wrote an x, and where I saw an x, I wrote a y. All right, and then from there, the next thing you wanna do is solve for your new y. So I wanna get this all by itself. Me personally, I like the variable that I'm being asked to solve for on the left side of the equation. So I'm just gonna write this in the other order. And when I have a cube root, if I wanna undo that, I need to cube both sides. When I take the cube root, excuse me, when I cube something that is a cube root, those two operations are gonna cancel. So I just get a y plus four over here and I get x cubed over here. And then it's not too terrible to actually solve for y now y would be equal to x cubed minus four. So again, I interchanged x and y. I solved for my new y. The thing that I get to do next is just, instead of writing y here, let's swap out the symbols and write f inverse of x. All right, this is technically step three if you wanna go along with the three steps that I laid out for us in section 3.7, but there's my inverse function. f inverse of x, will be equal to x cubed minus four. And if you also remember from that section, we should have a graphical way of identifying inverses. If I go into my y equals and I type in my inverse function, x cubed minus four, I'm gonna hit graph in a moment. 
But if we think back to section 3.7, the graph of a function and its inverse, they should be symmetric around the line y equals x. y equals x, that diagonal line that cuts this way, should completely cut your graph in half. So let's see. If I graph this, does it look like there's a line of symmetry along, along y equals x? I think there, it, it looks like that. If you want to test it, go type in into y3 y equals x. I tend to make this one bold, so I scooch to the left of the equal sign till this is flashing, and I hit enter. And then when I hit graph, I can really see that these functions are mirror images of each other along this line y equals x. Okay? All right, so with that, we're going to head on over to example three. We're going to start restricting domains because sometimes you, you don't have a one-to-one -one function right out the gate. And, and math people were like, well, if we don't have a one-to-one -one function, what can we do? How can we get f inverse to exist? Well, we realized we could start restricting domains and all of a sudden functions would become one-to-one. -one. Now, we did that a little bit in section 3.7, but we're going to review it in example three. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Bye.